Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Censored to Celebrated. My name is Melita Noel Kentu, and I am your host. I am so thrilled to welcome you to episode number six. My guest today is Corey Silverberg, who is an author and educator, and here he is. Hi, Corey. So Hello. great to have you. Um, and just to do a quick um, intro and bio about Corey. First of all, I want to mention, and you may have all seen this, but he uh, was raised by a librarian and a sex therapist. And I have to admit that when we talked, I followed up on the librarian piece, and I haven't even asked about the sex therapist. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little interested to hear about that, Corey. Libra uh, librarians, librarians are more interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, maybe that's why I did that. So, um, But just to kind of give a little bit more of who you are and what you've been doing in the world of diverse sexuality and gender, uh, Corey Silverberg is a sexuality educator, author, public speaker, and was a founding member of the Come As You Are Cooperative. Uh, he received his Master's of Education from the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education and served as the Chair of Sexuality Education Certification for ASECT, which is also known as the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, and you teach on the topic of sex and disability, sex and technology, pleasure, inclusion, and access across North America. And of course, you're also a children's book author. And I just need to, while the camera's on me, I need to show this book because it is just one of my absolute favorites, What Makes a Baby. I know you're working on a series of three, so we'll look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and I need to just, we'll get to this, but just a little preview of one of the awesome pages. And this is um, artwork by Fiona Smith. So that's my favorite page. That's a little preview. We'll get to that in a minute. But welcome, Corey. So Thank good you. to have you here. Um, let's go ahead and get started by talking about the first question I always ask is, what um, what do you think about the alphabet soup, the LGBTQ plus 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 alphabet soup? How is it relevant, or is it relevant in your work? Um, and well, do you have a like, preferred term, I guess I would say as well. Uh, for myself, or just for that all of that alphabet. For all of it, just in, when you're talking to, <laughs> oh, in, uh, and it may vary with audience, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tend to use, I actually, I, I don't use the alphabet so much. Um, and if I do, I usually talk about LGB as well as trans and queer other people or experience okay. or bodies. Um, you know, I mean, the tricky thing, I mean, I mean, it's net, like, is it necessary? Anyway, it, it, it's here. The alphabet is here. Yes. And it's very useful in a lot of ways. Um, as an educator, and then it's very meaningful in a lot of ways to some people, um, and because I actually care about people, not just about what I have to say, um, when something is useful for a person, um, then I'm interested in it, and mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes something is useful for one person and actually can feel painful for someone else, and so then that's that's work we have to do. Um, nothing is all; it's never all or nothing. You know, it's never either or. Right. Um, so. So in terms of how I use it, as you said, it really depends on the room that I'm in, right? So if I'm doing a con doing a workshop with a bunch of queer families, um, we don't even really talk about the alphabet soup so much. Mm -hmm. We might talk about terms and identities, but often, uh, often it feels more like an insider thing because I identify myself as queer, and so it's just a space where we may all have some shared experience of that of those other letters. Um, if I'm speaking to a general audience, then I usually do something like LGB. And then I say, I say LGB as well as trans and queer because the thing is, you know, the fact that the T and Q are there is is it's complicated, um, and for some people it's problematic. And so, so anyway, so that's how I do it. But you know, when I'm teaching kids and writing for kids, I say this thing, which I also say to adults, which is like, I don't really think about terms of being, I don't think about terms as good or bad. I don't mm -hmm. think that words are good or bad or terms are good or bad. I think we can think about how they're helpful how they're hurtful, right? How, how they make us feel good or how they make us feel bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that talking about that is part of sex education, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, a, you know, a conversation that starts with, you know, with how do these things help and how do they hurt, to me is much richer than let's go around the room and give our identities or mm -hmm. give our preferred gender pronouns or give this or that, which can also be helpful, but it's just not the, it's not the way I work. So, um, so, ha so I'll just say one more thing is, you know, but you know, a lot of people fought for a very long time for us to even have an awareness that those letters mean words and that those have to, are attached to people. And mm -hmm. so the so the the language 
and and the phrase you know the, and the the kind of the LGBT IQ whatever um, it's very meaningful and relevant to me because I'm not working in a vacuum right that that you know I come I'm, I'm coming to this work as someone who's coming who's sort of just a part of you know sometimes decades sometimes hundreds of years depending on what kind of work we're talking about um, right. and it's always important for me to kind of not only acknowledge that for myself, but talk about that in a room. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting because oh, I'm here I am on this new computer. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, it's so interesting because I know some of what we've talked about in what it seems like you're getting at is there's so much complexity around this, and yet by starting that conversation off, and you said you do it with kids and adults, is just saying, you know what, let's simplify it and just talk about why is this language important, how does it hurt, and how does it help, and that seems like such a great way to approach a very complex topic. Yeah. And, and and the fact that you're also doing the separation out of, okay, let's go, let's consider LGB together in terms of, because that's sexual orientation, and let's mm -hmm. consider, you know, uh, gender identity uh, separately, and that, that they often do get blended and confused, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I love that, that you do that in a very simple way, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, particularly with the word that kind of I use the most for myself, which is queer, which isn't just one thing or the other. It gets very complicated mm -hmm. when some people take a label on that talks not only about who they desire, like it like, talks about like how they have sex and who they want to have sex with and who they are when they have sex. It's all of these things, yes. and so it's hard to kind of separate it out. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 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 fascinating, and I love, I love hearing my guests' responses to this question because it is... Um, it is so complex, and we all have such a different understanding of this, even th those of us who think about it all the time. And then, of course, there are people who, who watch and audience members who say, you know what, this is still all so new to me. I don't even know how to begin right. tackling this. You know, if you guys are having trouble right. with it, then what about me? <laughs> you know? Right, which, which is, again, why I like just actually talking to people and asking them how they feel and think about things, because yeah. I don't, you know, it's not, as a sex educator, it's not, I'm not interested in people kind of signing on to my politics in order to be in a room with me or to work with me. Like I could care less if someone knows, like like if someone confuses gay and something else, mm -hmm. you know, and but they're doing it from a place of like they just don't know, um, I could care less. I mean, I, I, if they're doing it from a place of meanness or they want to kick someone out of the room, then I care a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a real, I mean also, you know, because I'm, uh, most of my work is sort of about, it's sort of focused on this idea of inclusion. If you want to have a, if you want to have a genuinely kind of, not just diverse group of people in the room, but an inclusive conversation, you can't demand that everyone knows the same language because, mm. you know, mm. so much of this language is so white and so kind of liberal or neoliberal, um, mm -hmm. and it's so about some people who are college educated, and so, you know, and, and I do think, as you said, like, I think a lot of people see that stuff and think, like, oh, I'll never figure this out, mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately, I think that maybe sometimes they also think that, therefore, they have fewer options. Mm. And while you do have fewer options if you're a person of color or if you're poor or if you're disabled, I mean, like, there's all sorts of sy systemic ways that you get marginalized, you don't have fewer options internally, right? Like the thing is like our capacity right. to feel desire or to be loved or to figure out who we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I mean, it can be limited by the systems, but again, I think that, that it's, but it's a place where you can really, um, you can grow despite the constant oppression. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that absolutely. makes sense. Absolutely. It does, it does. And, okay. Well, and, and you're bringing some of this up uh, for my next question, and so just briefly tell us, I mean, you're clearly so passionate about this. You've been doing it for a long time. You've been writing for about.com in terms of being their sexuality guide. Is that the term for it? Um, uh, they, cha they changed the they term, changed. although I don't... Ah. Yes, now I, now I just say I write for them because they like the term expert. Uh, but yeah. I, I have a lot of problems with the term expert, so... Well, tell, uh, and tell I, us about... Yeah, tell us about how did you get to that work and to, now to writing the children's books. Um, so the about.com job I just applied for, it had actually been a friend of mine, a woman named Ann Siemens, who was a very old, old-time person. That sounds terrible. She's not that old. But anyway, she was, uh, she was, she was involved with Good Vibrations, uh, okay. the sex store in San Francisco, back mm -hmm. uh, before it was a cooperative and then when it was a co cooperative. And uh, her and a woman named Kathy Winks wrote a book called The Ultimate, no, called The Good Vibrations Guide to Sex. Yes. which was kind of like, it was like the 90s uh, uh, rewrite to The Joy of Sex. It was, a, it was an all-around sex manual that was so much more inclusive and, um, 
And it was basically based on how they were they were working at Good Vibrations. Mm -hmm. And they really, I'm a bit of a nerd about sex store history. Um, so <laughs> Kathy and Anne... Uh, it's very they didn't specific, sex store very history. Specific. Okay. I mean, yeah. That's what, being a nerd is usually about something specific. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Kathy and Anne didn't, didn't come up with all the language, but in writing this book, they really kind of established a way of talking about sexual pleasure, and particularly in the context of sex stores and sex toys, that was replicated by every kind of feminist sex store, including very much including Come As You Are, which was the one that I was involved in. Okay. So, you know, Babeland, and now today, Smitten and Kitten, and um, I'm going to forget them all, which is terrible, but there's lots of them. Uh, right. There's probably about, like 12. There's, there's Self Serve, and um, um, we all talk about sexual pleasure in a particular way, and, and, and it did, you know, and of course we all take our own spin on it, so I'm not saying that like, everyone's, it's not that we're all just saying exactly what they said, but um, right. it began with this very radical idea a Good Vibrations, um, which started in the 70s, and, but, really, but really grew into something in the 80s and 90s. Um, anyway, uh, so Anne, Anne was writing for About.com, okay. and, and I saw that the job was posted, and so it seemed like, I mean, it was a kind of a perfect fit for me because you get to write anything you want about sexuality. You get to write stuff that's you know about science and about politics and about culture, um, mm -hmm. and it isn't so much about you. Like so, the the, the material is meant to be for a general audience, and so mm -hmm. it isn't like my personality and, and my opinion, although it is my take. Um, mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. that's actually how I like to work best. Like I'm really not, I I really don't like to be in front, like I'm. It's hard to figure out how to talk about this because I spend a lot of my time in front of in the front of rooms, but I'm much more interested in facilitating conversations than I am in lecturing. Right. Um, and I like sharing what I know, but I have no interest, for example, in being well known or in being famous or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. It, there's mm -hmm. nothing about that that appeals to me at all. Um, in fact, about, you know, I get. Oh, go it's ahead. About the, well, it's about the conversation and relationship, and I know that's something yeah. that's very important to you. Yeah, and I, I and totally am with you on that. Just kind of, a, how do we amplify this very important conversation, and what are the right. ways we can do that? Yeah, right. And and I feel like you know one way some people do it is they choose to get a bigger and bigger platform, and they want to you know be on Oprah and you know write books and and become very well known, so they can so they can sort of forward the conversation. Um, for me, the problem with that is, is that in my experience of, you know, doing keynotes and, and being in positions of, you know, authority, um, I see what that does to one-on-one -on -one relationships wherein people feel like I know something special and yeah. I am therefore special or smarter or more powerful or more, you know, sexually together or any of these things. And when people think that about me, it actually really gets in the way of me doing my work. Um, well, it creates so such a power differential. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I've I've seen, yeah. Which I've seen some people work really well. Like, so for some sex educators or you know sexual sexuality teachers, I've seen them do that, and it actually works perfectly well for them. And the audience loves it, and they love it. So it, I don't actually think that the way I do it is the best way. I just know that it's the only way I can do it. So that's anyway, that's a very roundabout answer to your question. Uh, but I've been doing it since 2005. I love it. It's like it's like one of my favorite jobs because. Huh. You know, I get a lot of emails, so I get I get to interact with people online, um, yeah. and I get to research what I want to research, and I get to write what I want to write. They're uh, actually, you know, people tend to think it's a probably not a great place because it's just um, people think it's like a content farm, but they're actually an amazing employer. And and there's a complete. The other thing I'll just say uh, <laughs> is there's a total separation between what you write and the advertising. So there's lots of advertising on a site, and I don't always like it or agree with it, but in since 2005, in 10 years, I've never once been asked to write something different, mm. uh, to take something down, to do anything. Um, wow. So it's this, and they pay you. This is the, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, that getting paid writing jobs is not easy these right. days. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'll stop praising them, but uh, but I actually <laughs> tell people all the time if they have a thing that they're really good at, uh, they should look and see if there's a if there's a posting <laughs> on yeah. about.com. Well, no, it's great to know because part of my goal for Censored to Celebrate it in, in talking to people and asking this particular question is, you know, I mean, I have a master's degree in sexuality and I, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I did it because I'm passionate. And so how do we 
kind of link up what we're passionate about, whether it's about sexuality and gender or, or anything, you know, with actually being able to do it in the world in a meaningful way. And so it's just, I love yeah. hearing people's stories of how they're able to manifest their passion in the world around this, mm -hmm. around this topic in particular, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just inspiring anyway. So, um, so that's how you got into about.com and, and writing about sexuality for the past 10 years. And I had so much fun romping through your articles, I have to say, for, um, for my newsletter. That was really, really fun. Um, and I wanted to, oh, we're getting a lot of echo on my side. Okay, I gotta, okay. let me know, Sally, if that gets better. I will turn down my volume a little bit. Um, so there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully that does sound better. And I wanted to just ask a little bit about the book, What Makes mm -hmm. a Baby. Sure. And we're here on page, uh, oh, there are no page numbers. Okay. No, there's well, no will, page. <laughs> <laughs> I will read, and I know you have a whole reader's guide to this that people can download as a PDF. Uh, and I do see that Sally has a question, so I'm going to get to that after this one. Um, but this, this page says, when an egg and a sperm meet, they swirl together in a special kind of dance. As they dance, they talk to each other. The egg tells the sperm all the stories it has to tell about the body it came from. And the sperm tells the eggs all the story it has to tell about the body it came from. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit, and here I'm just going to show it one more time, um, tell us a little bit about what that page is about. I mean, it's so poetic with sure. the dance, and it's so not gender specific. So tell us right. how you decided on this language. Well, so that, it's interesting that that's the page you want to ask about, because there's, like, there's a very particular reason why ah, I chose okay. the dance metaphor, and it took a long time to come up to figure out the right one. Uh, and it actually starts with a, this, an anthropologist whose name is Emily Martin. And Emily Martin wrote a really important um, article, and then I think, I believe also a book, um, which maybe is just called The Sperm and the Egg. Um, anyway, she did this research um, where, uh, well, so to back up a, a bit, the way that we used to talk about the sperm and the egg coming together um, uh, was always, and, and even when you look at more techno, technical books, so not books for kids, we were always talking about the sperm uh, progressing, marching, etc., and then penetrating the egg. And it was, and and we really completely kind of gendered sperm and egg, not just in saying that a sperm has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and an egg has two Xs, but actually gendering them by saying the sperm is more aggressive. And, and in fact, when you look at the old picture books for kids, you know, the sperm always has a bow tie, and the egg has like a little tutu, and right. um, maybe lying back, and the sperm is marching. And the language is, I mean, often it's sort of a military language. Anyway, as it turns out, scientists, uh, um, as it turns out, that's not true. So as it turns out, uh, the egg, and science knew this. There, there was, the scientific knowledge existed that the egg actually, the egg does things both to prepare itself to meet with the sperm, but also to attract the sperm. And of course, that the body is a system. That, mm -hmm. the, that the vaginal canal, that the pH levels in the vaginal canal have something to do with it, and that it isn't some kind of, like, a bayonet stabbing into God knows what. See, it's always terrible, these yeah, things. Yeah, it is so very the quest, militaristic. Very militaristic. So I didn't want to, I, you know, my goal was to not lie. My goal was to not, like, not, or my goal was to not add layers of complexity that don't actually exist um, in telling kids about reproduction and conception and gestation. Um, so the question is how do you, what's a metaphor that allows these two things to be equal? And so the metaphor is the dance. Um, because in a dance, a, a dance, one, one person can lead, the other person can follow, um, uh, it, but, but, but those are choices and that, that they are equal participants. Um, so that's sort, of how, that's sort of why I use the dance. And the stories, is a, the stories is a metaphor for DNA. And in the book there's actually some little illustrations of strands of DNA. Um, mm -hmm. And that just kind of rose out of how I talk to kids about reproduction, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, like I actually think that, you know, I think it's because kids do sometimes want to know, you know, this. I mean, like they they want to know sort of how they came to be, and mm -hmm. and often parents. I mean, it, you know, it becomes it becomes a more complicated story for people who are using sperm or egg donors or or surrogates, um, and for for parents who've adopted, but it's still something that does need to be sort of talked about. And I, I guess, for me, the important thing is to separate, this is the biological stuff that you came from, and I'm your parent, right? Mm -hmm. That unfortunately, what I saw in the books about where babies come from is that we always conflate the two. We always say, you're, you were born because your father had sperm and your mother had an egg and they came together. That's mm -hmm. not always true. And mm -hmm. so 
we want to be able to honor parents for being parents and that they should celebrate that, whether or not they had a hand in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the conception of the child. Um, and we also don't need, to, we don't need to ignore that that conception took place and DNA exists. So that's, that's sort of how uh, the sort of the kind of idea uh, in general of the book. So the dance metaphor was specifically to address a kind of scientific inaccuracy that's sort of, it's sort of gendered. It's inappropriately gendered. I, I don't okay. think it's appropriate to make sperm have sperm wearing tuxedos. I just, I mean, it's cute. It's cute, but yeah. it's cute at what cost, right? It is cute. Right. It's, you know, it's hard not to, you know, even I, or well, Fiona, we have anthropomorphized the sperm and the egg. They have, they have eyes and they have arms, right? And sperms and eggs don't have those things, you know. So we do need to make it uh, relatable to kids. But as someone who grew up gender nonconforming, I feel like the cost of saying a sperm wears a bow tie and an egg wears a tutu is too high, right? Mm -hmm. Because right away, there's all sorts of messages kids are getting about there being two genders, of which, of course, that's not true. There's more than two. And that if you have sperm, you're a man and you wear a tuxedo. And mm -hmm. if you have an egg, you're a girl and you wear a tutu. Yeah. And, and, and it's too high a price because we don't need to do it that way. That may be true for many people who have sperm and many people who have eggs. Right? I'm not against the gender binary um, uh, per se, but anyway. Um, so that's the answer to that question. You asked uh, the thing about gender, um, but uh, oh, oh yeah, the thing about gender in that page, which is oh hello. Oh yeah, no, I just I just was putting up Sally's question and I didn't realize. Okay. I <laughs> uh, let, yeah, let's get to that because she's she's okay. asking specifically about the science of this, and I wanted to. Yeah, so it says it uh, takes hundreds of thousands of sperms, heads, chemistry battering at the cell of the wall of the egg in order to change it chemically enough to allow one sperm to penetrate and fertilize. Where is that story? And the reason, the reason is, that, is that the fact is the basis for telling men with low sperm counts that their fertility is compromised or perhaps non-existence uh, existent without assistance. So, Wait, yeah. can, you say, can you say that last part again? Oh, sure. sure. Um, I, uh, the reason I ask is that this fact is the basis for telling men with low sperm counts that their fertility is compromised or perhaps non-existent without assistance. Uh, yeah, sure. So the question is, where is that story? So, I mean, part of doing, um, um, uh, 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 part of writing kind of inclusively means stripping away a lot, right? So, so what was most important for me about this book was not actually telling a specific story about reproduction, but was creating a book that would allow basically any kind of parent to talk to their kid about reproduction. Mm -hmm. so, so, I, so I left out a lot of things. So for example, um, the book actually doesn't say how sperm and egg ever get together. Right. This is a book about reproduction that doesn't say that. What it does is it talks about sperm and egg, it talks about, it talks about gestation, it talks about the moment of conception, um, and then it actually there's, there's this sort of page, there's these two pages in the middle where there's prompts, there are questions for mm -hmm. the adult to ask out loud and then answer with the child they're reading to in as much or as little detail as they want. So the, what I would say to Sue is there's nothing in the book that actually would make it hard for her not to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Like she would very easily, do, like so again, part of the problem with the illustrations sometimes is that they tell one story. So by not having, so part of the, con it's kind of a compromise, but I didn't even feel like a compromise because to me, inclusion is more important. Um, it's more important for me to create something that works for a lot of different people than to create something that works specifically for one person. Um, so, so, uh, so there's tons of stuff that's not in the book, I guess is one way of saying that. But the book is meant to be a conversation starter, and it's meant to, it's meant to kind of, I mean, my approach to this stuff is to stand as far back as I can, right? So obviously, I'm still there. It's not about being objective or mm -hmm. kind of blank slate, but I try to impose as little of myself as possible, and I try to impose as little, in the, it, as you're asking about sort of gender, that's not really Sue's question, I don't think, but right. I yeah. try to sort of put, try to take gender out where it doesn't belong. Um, so yeah, so it's not, I mean, so the specifics of sperm count are, definitely aren't in there. And, and I hope that it works, it would still work um, if someone wanted to talk to a four to six year old about that. I'm not sure that a lot of four to, not, I'm, I don't know how many four to six year olds want to know that much details, but some would, right? Yeah. Again, the book is also sort of designed 
based on the ways that I have conversations with kids about sex, which is, and reproduction, which is to give a very little amount of information and then to ask a question and then to see where they're at. Um, and I'm so wondering, yeah. and I know Sally Sue has, uh, there are a number of questions coming up and we'll definitely can stay on hopefully a, a little bit afterwards and do some answering of those questions online because um, she's got some really good specific juicy questions for us, uh, for you. Um, but I know that you have this reader's guide that's 60 pages that's for the adult who's mm -hmm. who's helping to support the child reading this book, which I'm sure gives a lot of this um, more in Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so yeah, so like, so what the reader's guide does is it, it actually gives language if you want to talk about intercourse or if you want to talk about Sperm, a sperm donor or an egg donor, um, and the truth is, I'll also say like there's a little opening around fertility because Sue was asking about sort of, I know she kind of referenced fertility. Um, so one of the things that this book does that I don't think that any of the other books do, which was uh, which was actually I should say one of the reasons why I originally self-published because I didn't know if it would any publisher would allow me to do it, is it makes reference to the fact that that doesn't always work. Mm. Right, so the story of most when you look at books about where babies come from, it's always like mommy loves daddy. You know, they 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 got to bed together one night in a bed, and nine months later you were born. And as I'm sure Sue knows, because she's asking that question, and certainly I know, it's you know, it's, sometimes it's that easy. Uh, although to be honest, it's often that easy when you're not trying and when you're younger, yeah. um, and when yeah. you have people who are intentionally trying to get pregnant. Sometimes it's very, very difficult, and I didn't want, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing. Like I wanted to write a book that would honor that, right? But I also didn't, you know, I don't think it's appropriate to, like, talk to four to six-year-olds to kind of weigh them down with the difficulty of fertility issues, right? So, so there's one small line that just refers to the fact that sometimes it doesn't work, and that would maybe be an opening... Like, and, 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 so, and in the Reader's Guide, I give some examples of what you can do with that opening, and yeah. so... If this was something Sue was actually interested in talking about, that might be the point at which she'd say, well, you know, you know, she might use, there's a page that has lots of different sperm and eggs, and so she could use that page, and she might say, like, well, actually, you know, this book, this book might make it sound like it's easy, but actually it's not always that easy. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll actually point out to Sue is, and if you want to flip to, let me actually see, there's a page, there's pages where we talk about sperm and egg. Um, let me see the sperm, right? Okay, so there's this page where we explain what a sperm is, mm -hmm. and then there's this page with the bodies, and the bodies either, they, some body, most of the bodies on this page have sperm, uh, some bodies have eggs, and then there's bodies with neither. Um, and that was also really important to me, because, for, because the truth is that some of us are actually born with, and then certainly some of us end up as adults, with bodies that have no viable sperm or egg. right? And, and that's again like the story that just doesn't get told. Now, it isn't said in words. I don't say that mm -hmm. because it's a book for four-year-olds. But mm -hmm. certainly, when I'm reading it, the kid, the kids often will do that. They'll like, they'll like that body has a sperm, that body has an egg. Once they learn what mm -hmm. it is, and and then sometimes they'll notice, and sometimes they don't. And then depending if it's a child that I'm close with, I might point out, do you see how that body doesn't have either? And so it's a very small way at the age of four or five or six to plant a seed about the fact that this doesn't always work. Right, and, and and certainly, you know, as a sex educator who mostly works with adults, although that's changing now with these kids' books, um, you know, I see the effect of this particularly on women, women's bodies, um, <clears throat> where women are women are raised to be, you know, and these books add to that, to be told that like if you're a girl, you you know, you grow, become a woman, and you ha and you become a mom, you have you have babies, right, and that is what a successful woman is. And the truth is that for women who can't uh, conceive um, or who can't carry a child to term, it can be devastating. And maybe that'll always be the way it is because it just is a difficult, devastating experience. But I know it's made worse by the fact that we're always telling people that this is an easy thing, that when we represent reproduction, we always make it seem like it's just like, you know, it's like that. So anyway, so I appreciate the question. And, and, and I, yeah, I would say that I, I hope that the book could work for that, but I mean, but, but, you know, she'd have to tell, I mean, she'd have to try it and tell me, it, it might not, I mean, it's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, wow, we are, go we are going quickly through our time, which is mm. exciting, um, and I just want to acknowledge 
Thank you, Sally, for clarifying. Your name is Sally, not Sally Sue or Sue. So thank you for that. Oh, and thank you for all the fantastic uh, questions. And we will definitely go through those and, and spend some time with those. But I do want to make sure we honor um, everyone's time who's tuning in today and Corey's time. And Josh has a great uh, question that, again, I'm going to say, because we're already at 131, uh, and I do want to ask one more question of you, Corey, um, from me, that we'll get to Josh's question after if you have a little time to do that. Sure. Okay, fantastic. So um, my last question for you is, um, in your life, in your personal and professional experience, when is a time that you've moved from feeling censored around sexuality and gender to feeling celebratory? And this is one of my favorite questions, and people have wonderful stories mm -hmm. about this. So what, what would you say they, about that? <laughs> now, now I feel pressure. Um, uh, okay, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I'm... I'm white, and you can't always tell, but so I'll say it because I am. Um, and I look like a guy, a man-ish. Um, so to be honest, I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience of being censored, right? Um, okay. um, it's, it's, it's rare, you know. I'm, and now, I, well, certainly growing up, that was the case. Um, because I uh, really wanted to make a life in a community that doesn't look like me, and like I, I'm not interested in just spending time with people who look like me, and so my community doesn't look like me, uh, uh, and uh, um, so in fact, then I'm often in spaces where well, I, I don't feel censored, but I guess I I guess I would say that I that uh, I don't censor myself, but there's there's times as an adult where no, that's not censoring. Never mind. <laughs> I'm thinking on the fly. So okay. yeah, so I'm I'm gonna maintain the point, which is unfortunately because it's you know it's I'm mean, anyway, but it's just true, right? It's true that actually the people who look like me don't get censored all that often, mm -hmm. and usually they get encouraged to just talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, so my experience of it would be would be with myself, right? So it would be self censorship, yes. and what came immediately to mind because you asked about professional and personal is certainly like, you know, when I was younger and I didn't have any kind of, I didn't have language for talking about my own experience of being someone who, you know, probably the best category I would fit in is gender queer, although I don't really use that term to describe myself, but. Um, uh, I didn't have language for that. I didn't really understand it, and so I really wasn't. I certainly, I, I certainly never celebrated myself, right? I celebrated myself mm -hmm. privately because I had a very active uh, sex life with myself, right? So I always, I always had wonderful sex by myself. Um, but I didn't really. I would never use the word celebrate to to describe mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. own experience of my sexuality or gender, you know, until I was probably in my mid twenties, late twenties. And so what? And what changed for me was that I found kind of queer people, right? Mm -hmm. So that I found people who, not weren't always having exactly my experience, but were able to, to kind of let me be a bunch of things that didn't fit, right? So like, you know, um, yeah, like to have a body that looks like this, but to have to feel something that looks very different, to want to have particular kinds of sex that don't always look like the kinds of sex that someone who looks like me would want to have. Um, uh -huh. So, I, so I mean, I certainly now feel like I do have occasional experiences of celebration, um, and for me, that's about well, it's about it's about both kind of queer community and also disability community. So that I'm I'm lucky, I'm non-disabled, but I'm lucky to be a part of a lot of different kinds of disability communities, um, and that's certainly a space where I've been able to feel somewhat more celebratory, um, mm -hmm. because it's a space where I can actually be more honest about how I feel about my body, and then and then slowly inch towards acceptance of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, that. yeah, that's my sort of slightly depressing answer. Uh, <laughs> but that's, well, that's what, what, I, what, I, what I love about it is that it's, you're really um, answering around censorship. Uh, this is a big topic right now. People are really talking about this, whose voices get heard. And I feel yeah. like it's coming to the mainstream in a way that we haven't seen it, you know. And I, and I think um, and it's coming to the world of, diverse sexuality and gender in a way that we have not seen it until the last year or two in, in a really big way, you know, where it's coming up at every conference and there are aha moments and, you know, solidarity things being signed. And it's um, it's exciting and it's, I think it starts with our personal, um, we, we have to start with that personally and saying, this is my this is my privilege and this is where I'm coming from and I think it's really powerful to hear you say that so thank you for that and I do want to get to Josh's question because um, usually I end with what inspires you but um, I, I'm going to do a, a different turn on it with with Josh's question which is right here 
and he says, um, my question for Corey, and I have to say Josh was my very first guest on Censors to Celebrate, so it's always fun to have former guests come on and, and ask good questions. Um, and Josh says, my question for Corey is, the more I learn about human sexuality, the more questions invariably surface. Corey, what questions <laughs> do you ponder or ask yourself about human sexuality? <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, and you get a lot of opportunity to address any question you want on um, yeah. when it yeah. comes to uh, working on about dot com. So I'm wondering, is there yeah. something really particular right now, or? Well, I guess for me right now, it's actually trying. I mean, I guess it's just to, I'll, I'll gonna, again give a personal answer, which is trying to figure out what uh, the mix of like trying to figure out how to put together. Uh, sex life and a relationship life and a life as I get older and as I have less uh, capacity or I have less capacity for like for I mean like so I mean I'm, I'm you know for multiple relationships and for uh, I have less time right mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, so for me I'm like most interested in one primary relationship but it's complicated because I think that I'm not because I'm not really convinced that Kind of traditional monogamy works. Certainly, that certainly doesn't work. You know, I don't. I, I don't think it's always going to work for me. Um, and so, how to? So, for me, the question. I mean, kind of the questions that I'm pondering most. You know, are kind of. Well, I don't know. It's kind of like how do you keep? I guess it's sort of like maybe maybe a, one way of putting this is like how do you keep growing and learning mm -hmm. when uh, you have less and less time? It feels like I have less time to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I work all a lot um, and. You know, when I was younger, I just had more time. I also had more energy, right? I have to go to bed at 11 now, right? So when you used to be able to stay up till 5 a.m. and just have conversations and explorations, um, I do, yeah. I mean, I do sort of feel like, yeah, that that's the, a big question I'm pondering is sort of like, how do you keep, how do you keep growing? How do you keep, uh, keep open space for new possibilities um, when you have less and less time? I don't know. I don't know if that's a, 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 I wanted, I wanted a better answer, better, better question than that, but. I, I, I have to say, I am so with there. I'm so with you on that one. And um, okay. Josh, we, we'll we'll keep thinking on that one because there's <laughs> the other things that come up. But I think that's uh, very real for for people who are trying to juggle so many different things and uh, be in the the work world and are are personal lives. And I can I say one other quick one? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just, I just remembered. So the the other thing, and this is not a new thing, but it, for me, it's an ongoing thing, which is trying to figure out how I can work in a way that's that like that allows me to participate without actually taking up a lot of space, right? Mm. So this is again a particular thing about kind of whiteness and also looking like a guy. Um, you know that um, I do a lot of work. Most of the, I mean, a lot of the work I do, I do as I use the, I still use the term ally for myself a lot of the time. But it's like a question of like, uh, you know, one of the things I just do is I often say no to requests and I and I make recommendations. When I get requests to speak, I'll often say like, no, but here's three people or four people that you really should have go. Um, and, and which is great. I enjoy that. That's an important part of not always taking the platform, the, the you know, the megaphone when it's offered to you. Um, mm. But it is, but it's an ongoing struggle to figure out like how, how you work ethically, how you can work ethically um, uh, when when we're working in a system that is, uh, you know, fundamentally racist and sexist and homophobic and transphobic and, you know, uh, fundamentally unjust. I mean, I actually just think that the systems that we have are unjust. And so, how how do you do work in a way that's ethical, that is that is helpful, um, mm -hmm. and that also isn't all about like, oh, poor me, I have to silence myself because that's not how I feel. So that's another big thing that I'm working mm -hmm. on. Maybe it's not so much about sex, but it is. Well. Well, it's interesting because you really just talked about it in a very personal way, and then also just in the bigger world way, you know. So, yeah, I, li I like that. It's like a telescope. We're ending on a telescope. Okay. And not a telescope. That sounds good. Very cool. Well, we are. Gosh, we're at one uh, one thirty nine, thirty nine past the hour. So, thank you again, everybody, for joining us today um, for the sixth episode. It's I love getting your questions, and um, and I love having people like Corey on to share their, I won't say expertise, but their insights and, <laughs> um, 
and knowledge. And and um, Sa Sally made a really good point, Corey, that I wanted to just bring up is that um, people do have differential understandings of things. And the, and her point was, I want to make sure that we honor the knowledge that we do have and the and the passion and brilliance that we do bring into the world, and and are willing to share that and 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 own it, you know. But um, but I also take your point, Corey, where it's it's very much like you're not the only one with this with this information. And maybe it's your own individual take, but there are lots of other folks whose voices are really important in this work as well. And yeah, and, and I know we're out of time, but I'll just, I want to add. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. And, and, it, and it matters who's speaking, right? That I actually think I'm, you know, I'm much more interested in hearing, in some ways, this is a generalization, so I'm qualifying it. I'm much more interested in hearing, in some ways, from Sally's than from me's. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and so it's absolutely true. I, I, I'm not about like like ignoring or silencing knowledge, um, yeah. but I feel like we only hear the knowledge from certain people, and usually they look like me. So for me, it's often about how how can I back out of the room a little bit. Um, yeah. But anyway, so thanks for that. Yeah, well, I think this was this was great, and I always want more time. So um, we will we will take it offline or onto the, <laughs> the comment section and do some work uh, looking at people's questions there. Thanks everybody for joining us on Sensor to Celebrated. Um, if you do want to opt in, we have a notification circle, and I'll also post the if you want to get on the email list. I send out a newsletter and a reminder before shows start, so that you can be in on that um, until March when we will have some uh, researcher coming on sharing her very new research about um, kids who are identifying as transgender. She'll be coming on mm -hmm. in early March and I'll be putting that information out soon. So until then, uh, thank you again, Corey. You're and um, how can people find you? Just before we um, find So uh, I'm on about.com, which is just the website is sexuality.about.com. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have like a website, which is just my name, CoreySilverberg.com, that sort of Care, has all the basic information, uh, and then I'm on Twitter at at about sexuality. Great, and I do want to just say that we met uh, via um, social media, and so I've just been so uh, grateful and impressed at how accessible and wonderful it's been to kind of connect with you that way. And hopefully, we'll meet in person someday too. So. Someday soon. But until then, we've got uh, the fabulousness of technology and HOAs. So, um, and of course, we have folks coming in from all over to, to watch this and be part of the conversation here. So I appreciate that. And I hope everyone who's in cold weather right now is staying warm and uh, continues to have some electricity and heat <laughs> and running water. Uh, very important. So good luck to everyone. And until we meet again, celebrate all the people in your life. And um, I'm Melita Noel Kentu signing off. Bye. Hi. <laughs> Bye, Corey. Bye. <laughs>